professors there, professors with PhDs, offering PhD level coursework in the Institute for Creation Research. They're a full blown university, and um, they do very good work there. On their website, www.icr.org, they lay out very succinctly 14 evidences for a young world. Now, I'm not going to cover all 14, but um, uh, a young world is important from a creation viewpoint because we believe if God created a old appearing universe, that from that point forward we would not find much change in terms of age. Uh, I find these uh, evidences quite fascinating. Let me just read a few of them for you. If we look out into the great expanse of the universe, let's start off with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's start with the heavens. That port of creation is almost like a footnote uh, in, in the creation account. Sort of like when he talks about the stars, and he made the stars also. This other little footnote in, 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 uh, in Genesis 1. We find when you peer out in the universe things called galaxies. Uh, these galaxies basically look like uh, little radiating stars. They have this nice little spiral to them and such. And um, there are many stars, very, very many stars. In fact, our own galaxy, does somebody know the name of our galaxy that we live in? Hint, it's named after a candy bar. Milky Way. There you go, the Milky Way. Now, the stars in our own galaxy rotate uh, around its center with differing speeds. And it turns out that this is a problem for evolutionists. And it's called the wind-up problem. Galaxies wind themselves up too fast. The stars rotate about the galactic center with different speeds, the inner ones going faster than the outer ones. The observed rotation speeds are so fast that if our galaxy were more than a few hundred million years old, it would be a featureless disk of stars instead of its present spiral shape. It just wouldn't be the shape that you have it. Now, this is a big problem because our galaxy is supposed to be 10 billion years old. There's several orders of magnitude difference in what you find there. In fact, evolutionists have known about this problem for over 50 years. And they have each come up with a different solution, but the, uh, the, their solution fails after a brief period of popularity. Uh, in fact, the Hubble Space Telescope has uh, only compounded their problems. In addition to that, there's too few supernova remnants. We know from astronomic observations that when a star dies, it produces a supernova. It explodes. And you see remnants of this star that should be visible for about a, at least uh, a million years by astronomic observations and calculations. And so what we find in our own galaxy uh, is that we only find 200 supernova remnants. I don't know if you remember, but it was in the news about 10 years ago or so that, that uh, uh, astronomers witnessed a supernova. And one happens every 25 years or so. So these things are something that are observable within people's lifetimes. We can actually see it exploding. There's a problem. With only 200 supernova remnants, that means uh, our current galaxy is only about 7,000 years old. That's the number consistent with that. You'd expect to find far many more if you're expecting billions of years. There's another problem in that comets disintegrate too quickly. According to evolutionary theory, comets are supposed to be the same age as the solar system, about 5 billion years old. But every time a comet orbits close to the sun, it loses an enormous amount of material. The sun just rips all this stuff away. That's why you see the tail, the plume going. It's basically a big snowball floating in space. It's just an ice ball, maybe a methane gas or a methane ice or something like that. But most comets typically have ages of less than 10,000 years. What do you do with that? In addition, looking then at the Earth, and you look in the Earth and you see the basic processes that are here. One of the major uh, principles in geology is called the principle of uniformitarianism. That is, the processes that you see working today, the flowing of a stream and an occasional thunderstorm, washing things into the ocean or a river, uh, etc., wind blowing and eroding, etc., uh, were the same processes that occurred many, 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 many years ago. Well, if that were the case, we should be able to make a case for how much mud should be on the seafloor. Now, by uh, various estimates, water and wind erodes 20 billion tons of dirt and rock from the continents and dump it in the ocean. 
this, this material accumulates on a very hard ocean floor. The ocean floor is made of the salt. It's a lava flow from the hot interior, and it comes as a very hard floor. So there's a distinct difference between a lava rock base and this mud and muck that's coming down from the rivers. And it accumulates, and the average depth that has been discovered through seismic soundings and so forth throughout the whole ocean is less than 400 meters. They can't find anything deeper. That's a lot of mud. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. 400 meters is a lot of mud. But the, uh, here's the problem. The main way to get rid of that mud, <clears throat> that, that evolutionary uh, processes account for, is called plate tectonics. Some of you have heard of this. Uh, the idea is that the continental plates that we sit on are still slowly moving, and as they subduct underneath back into the earth, they scrape some of that mud with them. At best, that would take a billion tons a year away. As far as anybody knows, the other 19 billion tons a year simply accumulates. And at that rate, the uh, erosion that we find in the uh, ocean couldn't possibly be any more than 12 million years old, given that things were happening the same way they do today as they were in time past. So what if there was something big and global and catastrophic, like a flood? You think that might change how much was... I think there was an enormous amount of stuff dumped in the ocean at that time. There's another interesting fact, too. So there's not enough mud in the, uh, in, in the oceans. It should have been choked with sediments several kilometers deep, and we don't find that at all. What's also very interesting is that uh, when the Apollo mission uh, was launched, they were trying to calculate... They actually turned to this uh, fellow whose book I recently purchased, uh, Dr. Walt Brown, who was a, a director at the Air Force Academy. for the, uh, 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 And they asked him, uh, Dr. Brown, uh, you know, we're going to land this thing on the moon, and we don't know how much dust is up there. We don't want to send a, 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 a vessel up there and have it sink in the dust. How much should be there? We said, well, how old is it? Well, it's about 4 billion years old. Okay, well, they calculated the flux rate per area. It's a simple calculus problem. Just getting the parameters to plug into it a little hard. So with some experimentation, he says, well, you ought to have, oh my gosh, several hundred feet of dust up there. It ought to be a real problem. Remember, we hadn't stuck anything up there. We didn't know. So if you recall, the lunar lander, do you remember what the feet of the lunar lander looked like? They were on the end of these very long poles and they had these big padded feet underneath them. Now, why would you send all of this hardware up there if you're going to set down on an inch of dust? Because they honestly thought that's how much dust would be there if it was that age. And that's a true statement, if, the, if it was that age. Again, arguing for a young moon. Studies that have occurred concerning the Earth's magnetic field have also produced some interesting information. <clears throat> The Earth has a magnetic field. That's why your compass works and aircraft can navigate and so on. And uh, we have observed since the uh, 1800s, I believe, the strength of this magnetic field. And since that period of time, we have observed that the Earth's magnetic field is decaying too fast. The, uh, uh, it decreases with a half-life of about 1,465 years, give or take 165. Now, the theories... Uh, there's a wide variety of theories that try to explain this decrease. But the big issue is that if you look at how strong that field would have been, 20,000 years ago it would have been the strength of a magnetic star too strong for life to form, too strong for our molecular elements to even stay intact. Again, another argument for the fact that a young Earth. DNA observations, as we have sequenced genomes and done other fascinating things with the more powerful tools that the medical sciences have. I won't get into surgery, but uh, uh, we certainly know a lot about DNA. You've heard about DNA evidence in courts. The DNA evidence has to be collected properly, etc. So we know something about that now. And one of the things we have observed is that biological material decays too fast. It decays too quickly. Uh, the, uh, the, the natural radioactivity, mutations, decay, all kinds of things degrade DNA. But the rate at which it decays has forced evolutionists to revise the age of a mitochondrial Eve from a theorized 200,000 years down to as possibly as low as 6,000. DNA experts insist that DNA cannot exist in natural environment any longer than 10,000 years. That's just as long as you can get DNA to last. After that, it's totally oblivious and, and obliterated. 
However, thousands of DNA, fossil, uh, DNA evidence has been recovered from fossils allegedly much, much older, Neanderthal bones, insects captured in amber, even from dinosaur fossils. Bacteria, allegedly 250 million years old, apparently has been revived with no DNA damage. How can that happen? There's too much helium in minerals is another problem. Now, uh, I won't get too scientific for too long, but I'm just glossing over some of the very high-level uh, issues here. The Journal of Geophysical Research showed that uh, uranium and thorium, when they decay, they produce helium. And helium, as you know, is the stuff that you blow up balloons with, right? You know, kids go to the store, they blow up the little I love you balloons or whatever, and girls, my girls love balloons, so they know all about helium. And uh, it's a very light uh, it's, uh, element. It's uh, numbers uh, two on the atomic uh, scale here. And basically, we have far too much helium in the minerals. What's happened is that we have dug up uh, crystals and minerals from very deep in the earth. There's no way that helium could have escaped naturally. And what we find is that helium has been leaking for only about 6,000 years. Again, way too much for something that should be far older. Way too much helium. Uh, same problem with carbon-14 in the deep geologic strata. You shouldn't have. There should be no carbon-14 atoms because of their very short half-life in strata any older than 250,000 years. But they find a ton of it down below. Just absolute enormous amount of it is there. Again, arguing for a young Earth. If you move to the uh, uh, different area of sciences that kind of cross between archaeology and uh, paleontological digs and finds, the evolutionists have a very interesting uh, age for, for humans. They believe Homo sapiens has basically been around for 185,000 years. That that that. Finally, a, a monkey was sitting around in a cave, you know, pounding on a rock and said, yeah, I'm tired of this. I'm going to a condo. <laughs> I'm going to stand up and move out of here. And that's when everything got better. Um, now, there's a problem with this. If we've been around for 185,000 years, and this is, oh, by the way, before agriculture began, uh, during this time, the world population of humans would be roughly constant, between 1 and 10 million. And all this time living, dying, burying their dead, and often burying their dead with artifacts, you know, a, a cherished uh, ring or something with them. And uh, by that sense, uh, I mean, in that scenario, they should have buried at least eight, at least, at a minimum, at a low, eight billion bodies. You should find eight billion graves of these ancestors of ours. Now, if that's correct, bones should be able to last, um, uh, bones really shouldn't last longer than 200,000 years, and so many of the supposed 8 billion Stone Age skeletons should be around, including the buried artifacts. But there's a problem. Only a few thousand have been found. This implies Stone Age was, the Stone Age period was shorter than evolutionists thinks, perhaps only a few hundred years in most areas. Not enough skeletons to account for all that. Okay, so the bones are not there. The artifacts should be. Agriculture is too recent. This is a doozy. You talk about, so one of the elements of good science is sound reasoning and good logic. Get a load of this. The usual evolutionary picture has men existing as hunters and gatherers for 185,000 years before the Stone Age. And, uh, excuse me, during the Stone Age, before they discovered agriculture less than 10,000 years ago. Now think about that. For 175,000 years, you had folks wandering around picking fruit from trees and just, you know, hunter-gathering. Just interesting seed. What do you do with that seed, Fred? I don't know. I just chuck it over here. Go to the next fruit tree. They went 175,000 years before they figured out you could stick a seed in the ground and culminate it and make some fruit out of it. Agriculture history is simply too short. In fact, I find it amazing that none of the 8 billion people should discover that plants grow from seeds. More likely, people were without agriculture for a very short time after the flood, if at all. And in, in, in total, history itself is too short. Stone Age Homo sapiens uh, supposedly made written records about four to 5,000 years ago. But prehistoric man built these megalithic monuments. They made beautiful cave paintings. They, they even made records of the lunar phases. What took them so long to figure out how to write something in, uh, in a more concrete form? The biblical time scale, again, much more likely. That's just a quick summary from the Institute for Creation Research on what they find to be some very strong 
evidences. Another uh, good source of material has been the Creation Research Institute, that the universe is too finely tuned. The universe is simply too finely tuned to, to happen uh, to make life possible. The elementary forces of gravity, electromagnetism, and the atom, even the atom, are precisely what they need to be. The Earth's size, its distance from the sun, the rotational period, the Earth's composition, the many other factors, all of them are just right. Do you know that we have to have the moon exactly where it's at? If we did not have the moon exactly where we're at, do you know what would happen to this planet? Every, I forget what the frequency is, but it's less than 100 years, because the Earth is tilted at a 23 degree axis, if the moon were not there, the axis would flip. So the Earth would be flip-flopping around like an unstable basketball through space. Think that'd do a number on the plants? <laughs> First, it's, we're coming out of winter, now we're going... I mean, what would that do to the... That would just be chaos. In fact, if you look at the other planets that are out there within our own solar system, it's, it's astounding what you find. Listen to the conditions on some of the planets that are nearest us. In Mercury, you have three days for every two years. The planet rotates very slowly. That means one side of it's always facing the sun. Ah, it gets up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit on the hot side and minus 350 on the cold side. Seasons? Forget it. Not existent. What about Venus? Oh, there's a lovely place. Sulfuric acids cloud the entire planet. It's the hottest planet in, as far as we know. One day is greater than one year. And oh, by the way, it rotates opposite of the other planets. What about Mars? It has a very thin carbon dioxide atmosphere. Now, the temperature range is deceiving. On the surface of the planet, you actually get minus 63 degrees to plus 73 degrees. Well, maybe I could handle that. One problem. The temperature drops drastically every inch you go above the surface. My toes are freezing. My toes are baking. My head would be frozen. Every inch up. It has a radical temperature change. Doesn't sound too conducive to life to me. Jupiter radiates twice as much heat from within as it, radi as it receives from the sun. It is an extremely a violent planet. It has severe weather systems that last 300 years. The lightning strikes are 10,000 times more powerful than Earth, and it's mostly hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, gas hydrogen, metallic hydrogen. And yet, if Jupiter did not exist, it serves a very important function for the Earth. It destroys a lot of comets that come our way. It is, it is the second largest gravitational pull with the exception of the Sun. Let's look at Saturn has a 29-year orbit. Its hurricanes are 10,000 times stronger than the Earth's with 1,000-mile-an-hour ammonia winds blowing across the surface. Yeesh! I can't smell a squirt of ammonia in my bathroom after Angela's done cleaning. How would you like a 1,000-mile wind of it blasting across you? Doesn't sound great to me. Uranus is the most curious planet. In our solar orbit, all of the planets I've described turn about their hinges this way, perpendicular to the solar plane. Uranus is tipped this way. It orbits like a rolling ball, and for 42 years, its south pole faces the sun, 42 years of light, and then for 42 years, the north pole faces the sun, 42 years of, of, of darkness as it flips around. Strange planets out there. You want to know some more fascinating things about this universe? There are several universal constants that are essential to the mathematical description of the universe. The fact that we can even describe it mathematically and simply is a testimony to the fact that there has to be a creator. Any of you heard of Professor Anthony Flew? He is one of the staunchest um, atheistic evolutionists in favor of Darwinian evolution that exists. And he uh, is a uh, professor in, uh, over in Britain. Uh, I'm looking, scanning here. I didn't use my highlighter to find precisely where he was at. He's a professor of uh, biochemistry. At, uh, no, that's not him. That's another fellow. Anyway, this fellow, after uh, uh, studying DNA sequences in the human physiology, ditched evolution. He says it can't happen. Now, he didn't become a Christian, but at least he got off the evolutionary bandwagon and says this ain't happening. 
He says, there's just no way this could happen. And he says, quote, My one and only piece of relevant evidence for an Aristotelian God is the apparent impossibility of providing a naturalistic theory of the origin from DNA of the first reproducing species. In fact, the only reason which I have for beginning to think of believing in a first cause God is the impossibility, the impossibility of providing a naturalistic account of the origin of the first reproducing organisms. <laughs> this is comparable to uh, Hugh Hefner becoming a celibate. <laughs> Anthony Flew is not known to be friendly to creationists at all. He abandoned it, ditched it. Was it published? No. Not over here. What do evolutionists stay, state about some of these things? And in fact, for many of the uh, positions I've, I've uh, said, they all have answers for it. If you go out onto the uh, Internet and uh, examine some of their, you'll find, I think there's one called uh, origins, origins.org or some places where they've got all, all of these responses uh, indexed. And I've read through them, and some of them are very ludicrous. But I want to now show you an area of which I'm a little bit more of an expert in, and that has to do with the geologic column and the geologic strata and things that we find there. 